Hello and welcome to Sports Tonight. And this time in Sports Tonight Meets, we're very glad to have Spencer Oliver with us, the former European Super Bantamweight champion. Spencer, thanks for being here. Pleasure, Trevor. I want to take you back right to the start. When you first took up boxing, you were six or seven, I think. Mm -hmm. What got you into it? Because uh, most kids are kicking a ball around, aren't they? Absolutely. Age? I mean, um, it, I come from a boxing family. My grandfather boxed, my uncle boxed, my father boxed. My brother boxed and boxed professionally out in America. It's in so the blood. It was, it was in the blood. Yeah. I mean, most kids, as you said, were out, you know, um, going to parties and doing whatever. I, yeah. On my 11th birthday, believe it or not, I was taken as a spare to a, to a boxing show and I had my first amateur contest on my 11th birthday because you had to be 11 to box. Right. Now, that's quite <laughs> unusual. And were you hooked from the start? Absolutely. Loved it. Loved it from the moment I put the first pair of gloves on. And what used to happen was, because my brother was four years older than me, my brother used to beat me up all the time in my own front room. Right. My dad used to watch us sparring all the time. So when right. my brother was about 11, I was about seven. Okay. And my brother used to give me so many kickings, I think it put me in good stead for where <laughs> I ended up, because I ended up the better of the two of us. But I think it was purely because of that. I mean, week in and week out. He used to get the better of me. You had a, a fabulous amateur career, something yeah. like 75 wins in 85 fights. Yeah. The highlight was the, the Commonwealth Games in 94 yeah. and you won a silver medal. What are yeah. your recollections of that? It was in Australia, wasn't it? It was, um, well, it was in Canada. I mean, it Canada, was in Canada. I lost to an Australian in the final, okay. but my recollection of that was disappointment, to be fair. Um, I got the silver medal. I went out there, if you would have said to me before I went to the Commonwealth Games, because I wasn't expected to be picked or anything. I won the ABAs that year. All of a sudden, that elevated me to number one. I won a couple of competitions, and I and I got the, I got selected for the Commonwealth Games. But if you had said to me before the games you're going to win a silver medal, I would have I would have taken that with both hands. But when I was out there, and the, and the, and the competition started to unfold, I was doing really well. A guy called Robbie Peden was coming through um, through the other end of the draw. We boxed in the final, and I lost 2018 by sort of two punches and. And I feel that I just threw it away. I could have done maybe a little bit more and I should have got the gold medal. So the silver medal stays in my drawer t to this day. Fantastic. And you turned pro fairly soon after that. Yeah. Was, it, was it always just a matter of time before you decided to earn your living as a boxer? Yeah, always. I always knew. I never done well at school. I left school when I was 15 years of age. Um, I put all my eggs in one basket. I always knew I wanted to be a boxer. Um, so that'd that be the right basket, didn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, it could have been. It could have been. It could have been a disaster. Yeah. If boxing never worked out for me. I don't know what I would have been doing. You know, I would have been, you know, doing some sort of job, digging holes on a building site or whatever. So I'm very fortunate that boxing's given me the life that I've got now. Did a bit of checking up, and I found out that your first pro fight was a yep. four rounder against Des Gagano in Cumbernauld, Scotland. Yeah. Do, can you still yeah, remember you that fight? Why, I, I remember it really well. Yeah. Des Gagano. Had had about 103 fights, I think. He'd only won He's 20. He's a journeyman, yeah. He was a journeyman, <laughs> and one of, the, one of the guys had been the distance with Nazim Hamid. Unfortunately, Des is not with us today. Unfortunately, yeah. he passed away a couple of years ago, yeah. which I was really sad to hear. But he gave me a real good experience. Now, I've just come back from the Commonwealth Games. I've won a silver medal. I've turned pro. Now, I'm, I'm really up for it. Here we go. So, I've boxed Des Gargano, who gave me a complete runaround in Scotland. So, I'm really frustrated. I've sat down, I'm sitting there. I've won the fight, but I'm frustrated. He comes up next to me, and at this time you could smoke indoors. He comes up, sits next to me, pulls out his backy pouch, starts rolling up a fag, <laughs> and then I'm thinking to myself, what is this all about, this pro game? You know, I'm going in here, I'm being really serious. And, but um, it was a great experience, and there it was in, in one of the strangest places you could ever have a debut, up in Cumbernauld in Scotland. I tell you what, elf and safety would have a field day now with that, would it? <laughs> Absolutely. Did it, did it feel different fighting as a pro, that first fight from, from your amateur fights? Did it feel big different? Big time, big time. Yeah. Um, Without the head guard, with the smaller gloves, um, it was all a bit of a, it was all a little bit of a shock to me, really. Although, fortunately for me, Des was a runner and he didn't want to stand in trade. But when we right. did get close, our heads banged together a lot, and it was it was a complete change. But I think that the professional style suited suited, suited me more than the amateurs. So. It was something that I knew I was going to grow into. Do you remember what your purse was from that first fight? <laughs> I don't think it was very much. <laughs> I think I might have been lucky to walk away with a thousand quid. Right, right. Yeah. Well, fantastic. And then the biggest night of your career to date, Pickett's Lock in yeah. Edmonton, which is pretty much home turf yeah. in North London. You beat the Bulgarian Martin Krastev yeah. to win the European Super Bantamweight title. Yeah. And it only took you four rounds to do it. Was yeah. that the point when you thought, right, 
I've arrived now. I can compete with the best around. Well, do you know what? That was the first time I thought I was going into a fight. So I had, a, I had one fight of the year, a fight before with a guy called Patrick Mullins, which was a real tough fight, that which I which I stopped him in. But then we come to Crest Up. I got the phone call. I was on holiday and I got the phone call saying, you've been offered a, a voluntary uh, defence against the current European champion, Martin Crest Up. I thought, fine, I'll have a look at him when I come home. I went home, he'd had 33 fights and he'd won like sort of 30 or something. Very good fighter. But I thought, you know what? I fancy that. But when we when we was on the build up to the fight, I always thought it was going to be a twelve round fight. Now I'd never been more than six rounds before, so that was always in the back of my mind. But then when I hit him, I caught him with a good shot in the second round. He went over, and then I realised this is it. I can do it. And then when I won that fight, yeah, you're right. I thought this is it. I've arrived. I'm on the big time. I'm on the big scene. All of a sudden, you've got a kid. That's, I was having my eleventh contest, and all of a sudden, I'm, I've been elevated to number five in the world, going from being number. Six in Britain, or something. and I think so you, you won the um, the sports writers box for the year Absolutely. in '97 as well. Yeah, yeah, um, I, yeah. I won, I won a lot of things actually in '97. It, <laughs> it was going, it was going really well. Unfortunately, '98 <laughs> wasn't such a good year. We'll we'll come to that after the break. I, I want to talk to you about the fact that you were fighting so often because these days fighters seem to fight a couple of times a year. You were yeah. defending that title every yeah. couple of months. It seems. Absolutely. I um I won the European title and defended it four times in the space of twelve months. So. Um, to say I was a busy little bee would be an you understatement. Were. It was it was not so much the fighting because I think I, I stopped two in four rounds and um, and and went twelve points twelve in, in a couple of them. But it wasn't the actual fighting that got me. It was the training, and it was also the making weight. The making weight was such a difficult thing to do. I mean, when I won the European title, I think I was twenty one years of age. When I lost it, I was twenty three, and I think through those years, my body was still growing and. Um, and that's where the problem lied. That's where the, you know that's that, that's that's where the injury really come from. Well, one of the defences before we get to that fight, one yeah. of the defences against the Italian Vincenzo Belcastro mm. at Ali Pali. Yeah. You won on a split decision. Yeah. Um, Tough fight. We, yeah. I mean, did that start you thinking? Well, maybe I'm I'm not quite as good as I no, thought. No, because or not? I, because I felt really comfortable with it. But if I tell you the story before before that fight, I I was uh, I I couldn't even touch my hand because I had such a bad hand from sparring. I had to have a quarter zone in my hand, and I had poison in my foot. So I was on crutches and, and, and I couldn't even, I thought I'd broke my right hand. This was a week before the fight. I had my foot lanced, so that was, that was all all right. So I could I sort of walk again and I had a quarter zone injection in my hand. So there was a lot of problems going into the fight, but I felt really comfortable up until about sixth or seventh round and we had a bad clash of heads. I thought I broke my cheekbone and we had a bad smash of heads and I got a split across my right eye. And I think then it was the first time that sort of, I felt I've still got a long way to go and I had a bad cut of, doctor kept taking me to the corner to have a look at it and I think it was inexperienced really and I allowed him to get back into the fight but I think that I made the, the fight more difficult than, than it actually actually was that didn't knock my confidence at all and think wow now stepped up a level I think it was just more me learning more about the trade. And were you conscious at this time when you kept defending successfully mm. how popular you were becoming with with the fight fans in yeah, this country? Yeah sure I was I, I, I was quite aware of it and I was always told, unfortunately for me, Jackie Lee, who was my trainer, always kept my feet on the ground. I had a good team around me um, and he told me, you know, you just tip the iceberg, you don't lose your feet, you know, people don't like that. So I was always told to treat people like you meet the same people on the way up as you do on the way down and, and that sort of kept me level headed and I was always told, you know, treat people the way that you'd like to be treated. And so I always kept that and I think that people appreciated that. People liked the fact that, you know, I just see myself as one of them who was good at my job and I, I never lost that who I was. And I think that that's very important for any, any sports person. And I did read, and you can tell me if this is true, that you were acquiring a few um, celebrity pals, Sean Bean Absolutely, and, and yeah. Tony Harvey from E17 yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, they, they all used to come. Tony Morton was a very good friend of mine. Um, he was from E17 and Sean Bean used to come and watch all my fights. So. Um, Robbie Williams, I think, was even at one of my fights. So it was, it was all looking uh, really good, and I was, on, and I think I was, I was capturing the pub, public imagination. I think that sort of, you know, um, Nazim Hamid had just gone, yes, and they was looking for a new British star to come on the scene. And I think that the TV and the media sort of liked me, and they tried to build me up. Um, I think they'd done a great job in doing it in such a short, short space of time that I was at the top. I think uh, um, the publicity was excellent for me, and I think. To me, your personality was vital in that, came mm. across, as well as your actual boxing skill. Sure. You know, in the same way as Nassim Hamid, really, yeah. because he was more than just a fighter. Yeah. And I kind of got the same impression yeah. with you. I think that that's very important that you've got to sort of be as good out of the ring as you are in it. Um, Nassim Hamid went down that road of being a cocky, arrogant, 
little so and so, and and it works for him because people yeah. actually saw him as a sort of villain. But he there was a very fine line between being a villain and being very arrogant and not very nice. He was but only Na copying Na Ali. Na yeah, Naz got <laughs> but Naz got it right though. People yeah. sort of like was Naz and Chris Eubanks got it a lot right. They used to go and see him, but it was more like a show for them. Yeah. With me, I just wanted to be a people's champion. I always remember being a kid. It wasn't about the money. I wanted to walk around the road and people remember me for what I'd done. And so I just wanted to be like the, sort of like the Barry McGuigan type person where people just sort of loved you for who you was. Yeah. I think that was important for me. Naz sort of built up a different persona about himself, but it worked for him. And me and Naz are still good friends today. And the, the ambition, was that always to be world champion? Yeah, nothing less. Nothing less. Anything less was, was an underachievement. Um, and I think that that's why I struggle so much today coming to terms with it because I was like number two in the world by the WBC and WBA and I was European champion. I was only just turned 23 years of age. I had the world at my feet and then to wake up in a hospital bed and realise yeah. it's all gone. That was a frustrating thing that I never got my world title shot and I, and, and I went on to see people win world titles that really, no disrespect to them, but wouldn't have, wouldn't have tied my bootlaces at the time. Mm. We'll, we'll talk in detail about the Devikov fight after the mm. break, but I, I'm just curious, having looked at your record, I was quite surprised you never fought professionally outside of the UK, did you? Do no. You, do you, is that a regret? No. Would you have loved to have had a, a glamour night in Vegas? I think, I think I would, but I think the home support was so big for me um, that it was financially more rewarding for the, yeah. for the promoters to put me on in England. I think that TV, Sky were promoting me at the time. They were paying big money for the shows. I was filling like Albert Halls and I was filling, you know, um, uh, Olympia. And so it was financially beneficial for the promoters to put me there. And yes, I would have loved to have boxed abroad, but only when I'd won a world title. I think that I think the, the main aim was for me to win a world title in this country and then we could have looked to expand and go on from there. But unfortunately, you know, we never got that opportunity. Mm. I mean... From the time that you turned pro until before you thought the, Dev uh, the Devikov fight happened, yeah. did any of your family or, or friends ever express any misgivings about you being a pro boxer? No, my mother. Just my mother. My mother never went to... She never went to one fight, not one amateur fight, not one professional fight. She used to sit by the phone, wait for the phone call to say that I was all right. She didn't care that I won or lost, to be fair. It was not something that she really approved of, but she appreciated that it was something that was in my blood. It was something that we all done, my brother, my dad. And she knew that it was something that I was always going to do and always going to want to do, but she never liked it. And she was probably the only one that was sort of really, not that I say she was against it, but it was something that she didn't like. She didn't like any involvement in it. OK, all right. We're back after the break and we'll talk in detail about that fateful night in that Devikov fight that almost cost Spencer his life and also uh, life after boxing. Join us in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching Sports Tonight. And we're in the company of Spencer Oliver. That fateful day, Spencer, May the 2nd, 1998. Yeah. Um, you fight, fought uh, Sergei Devikov, the Ukrainian. Yeah. And actually, in the build-up to the fight, you were pretty confident, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, very confident, as, as I always was. I think that, um, you know, I didn't see Devikov as much of a, as a problem. Um, I'd beaten people that had previously beaten him. I think that it was just a problem of weight-making was getting more difficult. And I think I was always there was always the thought of me moving up to featherweight because I was number two in the world. We sort of stuck at this weight, and I wanted the world title shot. But yeah, I didn't. I everything went everything went according to plan, and it was um, it was something that I just see as a stepping stone, really. Do you remember anything of of the fight? Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. And I vaguely remember the weigh-in the day before, and it's sort of like it's like a jigsaw that like I'm trying to piece together. I can't. So if I run you through exactly how it was to the last thing that I remember, it's sort of like I remember getting on the scales vaguely and, and, and then I sort of remember sort of travelling to the Albert Hall. And I don't know if I remember that or whether I'm just trying to remember it. And then I remember coming up on a crane because I had um, an orchestra singing me in at the Royal Albert Hall and it was this great big entrance and the big, you know, Spencer Oliver, the Spencer Oliver thing. And so I come up on the big crane and I remember throwing a couple of punches and the crane started rocking a little bit and I felt very uncomfortable with it. And so I stopped and I stood there and I just stood still and I didn't really do anything. Um, and next thing I remember waking up in the hospital bed some 11 days later or something. For, for those of our viewers who don't remember the fight or are too young to have seen it, you, mm. you were knocked down in the first, you were badly hurt in the sixth, yeah. you fought back and you yeah. were ahead on two of the three judges' scorecards yeah. until he hit you with a, a shot in the tenth, yeah. uh, which you couldn't recover from. Next yeah. thing, you're on your back, oxygen, all the rest of it. Sure. Um, I can imagine 
the relief of your father and your, your trainer, Jess yeah. Harding, when you did eventually wake up in hospital? Because Absolutely. as you say, you were out for a long time. You, you're almost dead, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I tell you, that I, I, it, was a, it was a real strange story as well. Like my, my, my dad had never missed one of my fights, amateur or pro. Now, he, he, we always take a, a team, Finchley Boxing Club, always take a team of boxers to Vegas and it, it fell on this time. Because I thought it was such a routine defence, I said, my dad, don't let the kids down, you go. Right. So he was over in Vegas at the time, of the time of the accident. So he had to travel all the way back from Vegas, not knowing whether I was dead or alive, really. Mm. I mean, it was it was literally touch and go. So that was a very difficult time for him. And I think the relief of them when I woke up, you know, my mother, my father, um, my trainer, Jackie Lee, mm. um, my manager, Jess Arden, I think it was just massive relief for them because I think the doctors were telling my mum sort of the 24 hours after the operation that, that they would shine a light in my eyes and my eyes stayed dilated. So they thought that the best way that I was going to come out paralysed down my left side and blind. So, you know, I've come out I think they must have left something in there because I'll come out better than when I went in. <laughs> they managed to get rid of the, the, the blood clot and that, that obviously was the, the main thing. Absolutely. You, when was the first time after you came around that you actually watched the fight? I presume you have watched it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only the once. Okay. I watched it once maybe maybe a month or so afterwards. Right. I was sort of like I wanted to see, I was intrigued to see. And it, and it was weird because it was like I was watching myself but it wasn't like watching myself. It was all a little bit surreal really i was watching someone who wasn't performing like i normally do and then seeing the injury and it was that was probably the single most hard thing i've had to do really it was very difficult to because i knew that i was watching the end of my career and that that for me was that was a killer do, do you put any blame at all on the referee after the sorrow could he should he have stopped no. it could he have stopped no, it? No, no 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 i don't no blame on anyone my i've spoke to my trainer about this where i used to go i was going back to the corner I had a heavy nosebleed. He knew that there was something wrong, but he kept asking me if I was all right. I was responding, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. Just a fighter's instinct. But there was obviously a massive bleed. I never used to get nosebleeds, and there was a bleed coming from the right. brain. He, was, he wasn't so no. I was responding that I was okay. The, I was winning the fight up until the point of the stoppage. So yeah. I, um, there's no blame to anyone. No blame to anyone at all. I think that... If anything, I just wish that I'd moved up a weight sooner. I was going to ask, because it was 8 yeah. stone 10. Were you yeah. comfortable making that No, way? I no. wasn't. I wasn't comfortable with that. I was struggling so much. It was unreal. I mean, some of the things that I used to do to make the weight was, were, were frightening when I look back on it. But that's boxing and, mm. and you, you always think the next fight, the next fight, unfortunately, the next fight never came. We've saw other tragedies. Um, Gerald McLennan, obviously, Michael Watson. But yeah. I, I guess as a professional boxer, mm. you just never think it's going to happen to you. No. No, and I always remember, you know, Michael Watson, I, I was a big fan of Michael's and I, I remember that happening some nine years before me and thinking, you know, what a shame, but nothing. And me and Michael have become really good friends now. I've done the last mile of the marathon with Michael. Oh, okay. Uh, me and Chris Eubanks and we held the finish line for him. And, and I remember Michael's hand being on my shoulder as he was walking and he was going, we're the true champion, Spencer, and all that. And I just remember looking at him and thinking, you know what, Spencer, you are one lucky so-and-so because, you know, fortunately for me, it happened to Michael and they, you know, the boxing board were a very stringent boxing board. I learned from the mistakes. I was sedated in the ring as opposed to being taken to the hospital. That, so they basically put me into a coma in the ring, which stopped any damage going to the brain because it shut everything down. And so I think by what happened to Michael, they learned from that and it happened to me and that effectively that's given me the quality of life that I've got today. So when you, when you obviously spoke to Michael and you saw the pictures of that fight, yeah. did you, I mean, you actually feel lucky to have survived it? Yeah. Big time, you know. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not a religious person at all, but I definitely believe somebody up there was with me that night because not only not only did that happen, and I feel lucky to survive, but I feel so lucky the quality of life that I've got. You know, I ran the marathon less than 12 months afterwards for the hospital that saved me, the National Neurological Hospital, who I couldn't, you know, be grateful enough to. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been given a second bite of the cherry, if you like, and it's. And it's just nice, and, and here I am some 14 years later and I'm still involved in the sport. Mm. And that's because that old thing that I said earlier on, you know, you meet the same people on the way up as you do on the way down, and if you treat them people with respect, you know, but there's people there to pick up the pieces and they, and they, and they, and they sort of keep you involved, and that's, that's fortunately what's happened to me. You mentioned that the safety measures had improved between the Watson fight and, and your fight. Yeah. Do you think boxing now is safer still than it was in your day? Yeah. Definitely, and that's not because of the medical side of things now. I think it's because 
of the nutritionists we've got in now and we understand the body a lot more and about rehydrating more and we're getting more people involved now where it used to be just yeah. you and your boxing trainer yeah. now they've got strength and conditioners they've got dietitians and nutritionists people monitoring the weight you get you're having weigh-ins six weeks before two weeks before so everything now makes it such a safe sport and that's why we're not getting the injuries like we did you know maybe 10 14 years ago when i was boxing so you're 23 years old, you've realised that you can't box again. How yep. long did it take for that realisation to sink in? I think it sunk in pretty quick, actually. Right. You know, sort of when I first come round, I, 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 I had three or four days after I woke up, I started to try and walk again. And I, I went into the mirror, I looked into the mirror in, the, in one of the toilets. I looked at it and I had half my head shaved and my head was so swollen. I had 80-something staples going from one side of my head to the other. That's when I realised, look, the boxing's gone. I just want to get yourself looking right again. And once that had happened, then it was sort of like just trying to come to terms with with not boxing again. As like I said to you earlier, it's like you know, one minute you're you're winning all these things mm. and everything was happening to you, and then the next minute, bang, it's all gone. And I think for me, I wanted to stay involved in the sport, and it was down to me to pick myself up. Like people don't like neg negative people; they like people that are positive. And I think that I proved that you know, out of a tragedy, you, some good can can happen if you just sort of believe in yourself and get on with it and and sort of I, I got in touch with the people at Sky and told them I still wanted mm. to stay involved with the sport. And they gave me that opportunity. And now I'm here doing shows with like, like yourself, <laughs> Trevor. And, it, and it's like, what more would I want to do? How did you find the motivation to do that at that age though? Because it was almost like rebuilding your life. Absolutely. Boxing was all you'd ever known. It, it, it was, it was like totally starting again, but starting again without something that you really wanted to do. Could you imagine that? It's a passion that, you, that you'd had, the same that, sort of burnt inside you and that passion still burns today because I never got that opportunity and that's why I think I'm so passionate about it and why I can do shows like this and do boxing shows and that because I'm I'm so passionate about it. What what do you say to people and organizations like the British Medical Association mm. who want boxing banned? It's crazy. I think it's crazy now. Why do I think it's crazy now? Listen, we walk out of this studio, we cross a road, there's an element of risk there. Just like there is in boxing, you know, we've got oh, they've done everything they can to make it as safe as possible. Boxing is, you know, yes, it's a combat sport and it's a one-on-one -on -one sport, but there's an element of risk about everything you can do, everything you do. Now, I left school, as I said to you earlier, I left school when I was 15 with no qualifications. What would I have done if I hadn't been boxing? Boxing's given me such a quality of life. I've seen the world. I meet lovely people every week, week in, week out. I earn a living out of it. I mean, yeah, I got injured, but... You know, that's life. Sometimes, you know, we get dealt rough cards, but we've just got to get over that. You've got a 16-year-old son, Kane. If yeah. he came to you and said, Dad, I really want to be a professional boxer, would you yeah. be happy with that? Yeah, I, it wouldn't. If, if he chose to do it, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't bother me at all. I, I, but he'd have to come to me as opposed to me going to him. Now, I've yeah. also got a nine-year-old daughter, Tia, as well. Because well, women to, box now, now she, That's what I'm saying. Yeah. If she comes to me and asks me, <laughs> it'd be a different story. Yeah. But, you know, that, that's it. Yeah, the, you know, the kids have got to ask you as opposed to you pushing the kids. And you're enjoying your life now as a commentator and as a boxing trainer. Yeah. You look happy. I'm very happy. Very happy. I'm, I'm in such a good place at the moment. Like I said, you've got a lovely son. I've got a lovely daughter, a lovely partner, Nicola. Um and life couldn't be better at the moment. So, I mean, yeah, it's going, it's going really, really well. I'm in a really good place. Well, look, it's fantastic to see you sitting here today looking so happy and so <laughs> no trace of bitterness at all. No. Spencer, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Pleasure, Trevor. Thank um, you very much. Hope you've enjoyed uh, watching it and uh, keep it tuned to Sports Tonight from myself and from Spencer. Bye-bye.